Hey, this is Will with the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Daniel Roberts, CEO of Iris Energy, a public Bitcoin mining firm out of Australia. In this conversation, we jump into ESG, new deployments, and much more. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast today. Really looking forward to the conversation. How are you doing? Thanks, Will. Pleasure to be here. Doing well, thank you. Awesome. So a lot going on with Iris Energy these days, and there's a lot going on in the public Bitcoin mining ecosystem itself. 2021 was really a banner year for mining companies going public on different exchanges, especially the NASDAQ. And for Bitcoin mining itself, that just meant there was a lot of capital moving into the ecosystem. We've definitely seen that with some of the moves that you guys have been making at Iris. Uh, so maybe we can kind of start off there. Uh, but actually, going to backtrack a little bit. We should really start with your story and how you got into Bitcoin mining and then move over to Iris. So uh, if you could kind of lay out the groundwork for how you got into Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, very happy to. Like you say, there's never a dull moment uh, in this sector. There's always something happening. Um, so maybe retracing steps to, to how we got into Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Look, we, we had a bit of a classic case. Well, I convinced myself it's a classic case of buying high and selling low, uh, being attracted in the bull run when Bitcoin ran up to around $1,000 a coin and then you know, it plunged to 500 and I sold it all and thought, this is nonsense, magic internet money. Um, then we dabbled in the Ethereum pre-sale, obviously did all right out of that. Um, 2017, you know, played around with a few ICOs and, um, you know, the, the flavor of the month at that point. And then I think it was late 2017, it kind of really hit us around Bitcoin, monetary asset, you know, gold 2.0, store of value, um, wh whatever narrative, I guess, you, you wish to attach to it. Obviously, the literature and the discourse today, the quality of it is fantastic um, and very much easier for, for people to understand. And, and back then, it kind of we read a bit of Nick Zabo's work, uh, Safe Dean's work, and um, thought, you know what, this thing, it's probably here to stay. If it's here to stay, it's probably going to go up in value because there's only 21 million of it. Everything's going digital. And then it was off the back of that that we started probing, I guess, the mining side of the industry. And it was really hard. It was really hard to unpack like what exactly was happening. It was a, an industry that was you know, dominated by a lot of self-funded players. There wasn't a lot of public information. So after playing around um, for quite some time and, and working with my brother, Will, we, um, I guess we, we came up with a, um, an idea, a concept, and, um, you know, the rest is, uh, well, I guess, recent history, but a, a lot certain ha certainly happened. Yeah, it's interesting that you guys went from Ethereum and the pre-sale and all ICOs into Bitcoin mining. It's very full spectrum, right? And most people don't make it back to Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of times they kind of sit in all the, the fun money over there and kind of wash in it instead of move over to the harder stuff like Bitcoin mining. So it's cool to see that your guys' journey has moved all the way to Bitcoin mining. Uh, just a follow-up question on that bit. What was tough about moving into Bitcoin mining in those earlier days? I'm assuming it's like 2018, 2019 you're speaking about, or is that even earlier? Yeah, no, it was around kind of early to mid, probably mid-2018 um, that, that we, we started moving more heavily into it and you're right like um yeah because i think for us like we're not traders we're not punters we're you know in terms of our backgrounds my brother will he was at macquarie an australian investment bank for many years doing structured products into traditional mining businesses so gold copper iron ore etc he was involved actually in setting up macquarie's digital asset team back in 2017 and in fact you know they were pretty early movers working with the uh, CME Futures, they actually invested balance sheet money in Bitcoin mining uh, back then. And then fair to say, you know, their appetite probably started to cool with the broader market around early to mid-2018, and that's when Will jumped out and we teamed up. And my background um, is in also Macquarie and then helped set up an infrastructure funds management business in Australia about a decade ago. Uh, right, right place, right time. We grew... Uh, to several billion dollars in equity, so ports, airports, wind farms, solar farms, traditional infrastructure, and I guess our backgrounds has always been hard assets, real assets, cash flow generating, managing infrastructure businesses. And when you started to unpeel the whole mining proposition, you could start to see this gravitation from 
people mining on their laptops and CPUs at home, earning 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. Those are the days. Uh, we weren't there, but good on the people that were all the way through the GPU era, FPGAs, ASICs. And then you start dissecting how mining economics work and it becomes all about the energy. And the bigger Bitcoin gets, the greater the economic incentive to spend money on electricity and computing power to get a piece of that Bitcoin. So we kind of played it out and said, hang on, this is turning into an infrastructure energy data center game. Um, yes, back in 2018, it was still you know, a little bit more, um, I guess, opaque, um, but we had a vision. Um, we started building and um, look, we're, we're pretty happy with where we're at today, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, Iris is definitely at a bigger place than it was then, right? And public market and all. There's not, I think it's like 15 public Bitcoin mining firms at this point, uh, maybe a few more and like some smaller exchanges, but uh, definitely in part of a smaller cohort of uh, public firms. Can you tell me about Iris Energy, what you guys focus on, specialize in, and then maybe where you guys are at in terms of hash rate of the network and future deployments? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the areas we focused on really early on was if you play this out, then what Bitcoin is driving is this insatiable appetite for energy at its core. Um, and that's the process of securing the blockchain, as you know. It's layering down every 10-minute block in this digital concrete, making it tamper-proof, um, censorship-resistant, giving it all those qualities that people buy the asset for. So it's a really valuable service. And I guess the thing that we identified is if it creates this um, enormous demand for electricity, then that's going to be potentially a bit of sensitive. You've got to really think about your social responsibility and your social license to operate. And it's really easy to go back to getting trapped in the ESG jargon for institutional funds and dressing it all up. But you know, that's important, right? Like You've got to tick the ESG box for institutional capital, but particularly for a sector like this, which is new, emerging, sometimes polarizing, not everyone understands it. Um, for us, we said, you know what, we've got to set the bar really high. We have to make sure that not only are we targeting renewable energy, but let's only go into markets where they want us where we can actually solve other problems and deliver positive externalities into that market. And that goes to the local energy market dynamics um, as a result of decline in manufacturing industrial loads, build out of renewable energy, and we can come back to that. Local communities that have been decimated by the loss of economic activity, partnering with local First Nations communities, and basically recognizing that you're going into jurisdictions, using other people's land, other people's power, um, becoming part of that social fabric, integrate with it. Um, don't go in and just take power, mine Bitcoin and suck all the profits out. That's not a sustainable business model uh, in our view. Yeah, it's a lot different than I've seen a lot of other miners. I think the conversation so far for Bitcoin mining has been that Bitcoin mining can go to those locations and it's incentivized to go to those locations. But I don't know if I've seen a lot of miners say that they purposely choose to do you guys use power brokers to find these places, like the traditional route, or do you guys expend a lot of money on research to try to find locations where it'd be amendable for Iris to be located there? How do you go about that process of finding locations that are socially responsible to deploy Bitcoin mining uh, machines? No, it's, a, it's a really good question and um, something we've spent a lot of time on. The, the parallels of the analogy I draw is renewable energy development. And we've got about 50 people um, in Iris across North America, Australia, and a lot of their backgrounds have been in infrastructure, renewables, data centers, energy, et cetera. And a number of them have been involved in greenfield renewables development. So when I was working at Macquarie, for example, between 2007 and late 2010, I was based out of London doing a lot of renewable energy development work, wind and solar, chasing the feed-in tariffs, et cetera. So the skill set and the experience of identifying areas on the network that have got a heavy penetration of renewables, available grid connection capacity on the high voltage transmission lines, going and door knocking local farmers, working with them to uh, acquire part of their land, lodging connection requests into the utilities, negotiating the terms and conditions of those, um, and then building out. Uh, these data center buildings that we've spent a lot of time iterating and designing, it's, it's not complex. Um, it, it's a bit of a formula that's been well trodden in other in industries um, and renewables development. It's really the flip side of that coin, right? For, for 
10 years, 15 years, we've had this race to secure the best sites for wind, the best sites for solar. Now we're saying, well, this is the race to lock up low cost excess renewables, monetize that excess power into you know, this new digital monetary network, um, but do it in a way where you're not um, exposing yourself to accusations of taking power away from other people pushing up power prices because you're genuinely targeting that excess renewables. And as you alluded to earlier, Will, one of the benefits of Bitcoin mining is its geographic flexibility. Uh, you can go and locate anywhere. You can do this off a 4G or a satellite internet connection. Now, it's probably not optimal, but it's certainly doable. Um, and that gives you an enormous geographic flexibility as compared to, I guess, old world, real world industries like smelting, uh, for example, where, yes, they went and targeted low cost um, energy, but there's still logistics challenges in exporting real world tangible goods compared to uh, just pinging it over, over a digital signal. Totally. Now let's dig into your guys' machines and locations right now. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a site coming online soon in British Columbia, or maybe it's already online. And then you just announced this huge deployment in 2023 in Texas. And then you have about 700 petahash on the network right now with plans to grow to 20 exahash by 2023. Is that... I think those are the numbers are, uh, I'm getting off the top of my head from looking at them earlier today. Yeah, broadly speaking. So let me uh, recap. So our first site in British Columbia, a little town called Canal Flats, that's been operating for the last few years and really provided the basis upon which we've continued to iterate our proprietary data center design. So one of our founding shareholders, Brian Fry, actually co-founded a company called Rackforce in the early 2000s that grew to be one of Canada's largest cloud computing data center platforms uh, before he sold out about five years ago to a listed company. Um, so we had that data center DNA early, um, really iterated these designs. That's about 30 megawatt site today. I think it's up to about 800 petahash, um, up from the forecast of 700. Um, that's the first site. Coming away, you can review our monthly reports. We disclose our daily operating hash rate and really strive to give transparency to the market on that, those operations. Um, we've then publicly announced an additional three sites, um, two under construction in British Columbia, one under construction in Texas. Um, the first or the next site in British Columbia, Mackenzie, um, that should be energized the first nine megawatts early Q2, um, so not long from now, and ramp up to about 50 megawatts by Q3. Um, and then we've got a, another site, Prince George, that is equally targeting 50 megawatts by around Q3 with some expansion potential in 2023. And then the final one is a recently announced 600 megawatt site uh, in Texas, which was fantastic to, um, to close a couple of weeks ago. Um, that site is up in the Panhandle region uh, in ERCOT, and we can delve into that a little bit further. But that aggregate announced power capacity is 765 megawatts. Fully installed would house around 22 exahash of computers. We've got binding orders for 15 exahash already, which I think in the current market might be generating eight, 900 million US in uh, annualized mining profit. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at options to finance the uh, additional potential capacity in due course. Yeah, pretty big deployments, which leads to me leads me to think about what the landscape looks like for competition going into 2022 and 2023. And I, I definitely want to get back to the ESG conversation we kind of opened up with. But for now, the, the competition part is just interesting here because we see a lot of different public miners and private miners are deploying hash rate to the network across the board. Uh, Right now, there's Scott's Crypto Conference is happening in Austin, Texas, and they just did a little farm tour to the the Rockdale site, the the Winestone slash Riot site that's like 400 megawatts or something like that. It's it's a huge facility. How do you think about competition going to 22, 2022 and 2023? Obviously, it's how Bitcoin mining works, but when you look at your capital costs and then your monthly costs for for building these things out and then staffing and then now we have all these like needs for lobbying. How do you kind of balance that from your CEO position? How do you uh, protect your investors who are also buying your public stock? And there just seems to be a lot of considerations with how fierce the competition is nowadays. 
It's a really good part to, to delve into. So, and I'm glad you mentioned investors because at the end of the day, we are here and we are accountable to our investors and our shareholders in the listed business, and they are number one um, and will always remain that way. We take our obligations very seriously to continue to build the business and deliver value to them. Um, before I get into the competition and how we're kind of building our platform, you mentioned Scott's Mining Conference. Um, special shout out, Mike Alfred, one of our directors, is actually speaking there at the moment uh, on our behalf on one of the panels with Dennis Porter. We were actually main, main stage um, sponsor. So good to be getting out there as Iris and um, starting to talk to more people about what, who we are and what we're doing. Um, in terms of the business and how we're executing, um, again, I alluded to the, the people we've got and the way we've approached this. It's traditional infrastructure. You're locking up the land, the grid connections, the substations, you're building out traditional electrical infrastructure. We then grade the land. We lay down concrete footings. We erect a building. We then fit that building out with specialised ventilation systems, internal networking um, and configuration, but it's now becoming quite scalable where we've iterated that design substantially, got a, a design that delivers a lot of operational efficiencies and now working with some of the global engineering firms who have standardised all the drawings, designs, and now rolling them out with um, subcontractors um, around the different markets. In terms of operations and execution, um, last year we brought on board a president, um, Lindsay Ward, I've known Lindsay for a decade. We worked together uh, at the Infrastructure Fund Manager for, for many, many years. Lindsay is a very seasoned infrastructure operator. So he's run ports, rail businesses, power stations, mine sites. Um, so his ability to mobilise large workforces, operations, execution is just second to none um, and is a fantastic compliment to Will and I uh, and our background. So He's wrapped his arms around it all. Um, everything's very structured, you know, lots of Gantt charts, project management, and um, it's going really well. And I think um, that's our approach, right, because we just want to own and control everything. We are building out a 10, 20-plus year platform. It's just who we are, what we do. We believe in Bitcoin. It's here to stay. We believe in the whole digitization, electrification thematic, the growing exponential demand for this low-cost renewable energy and the ability to monetize that. So we're, we're building for the long term, um, but also not um, compromising the short term benefits as well. And I think in terms of the competition, one of the great things about this industry is there will be a lot of winners. The industry is growing exponentially. There is so much opportunity. So we, um, we're, we're really comfortable. You know, we mentioned the 15 exahash uh, that we've got. Yeah, that would be delivering 800, 900 million in mining profit if it was installed today. That's still, what, 10%, 7% of the market today that's growing. There is a big piece of pie and it's growing rapidly and a lot of people will be able to, to do very well. And everyone, as you're alluding to, has got slightly subtly different takes on their strategy, you know, immersion, co-location next to coal-fired power and renewable generators, et cetera. And I think it's great as an investor, you, what you want is choice and options, different types of management teams, different strategies, um, and that's what makes a, a healthy capital market. Yeah, definitely. And let's just stay on the capital market for, for the time being. It's, it's interesting and notable that so many Bitcoin miners went public last year, uh, obviously taking advantage of the fiat system in order to mine more Bitcoin. Uh, Galaxy Digital had some nice reports coming out of the winter months about how many Bitcoin miners were were going public and accessing that capital in order to fund further operations, typically just doing some sort of debt or equity swap in order to purchase more machines, more facilities, uh, more staff, firmware, stuff like that. How do you look at it in in that context when you guys are building out new facilities and you're looking at your your stock as well and you're looking at your investors? How do you guys approach financing these operations? Is it the typical way we've come accustomed to or someone like Riot is taking out debt in order to, to, to finance operations or is it slightly different? It's one of those things where it's been a staged approach to capital markets. So initially and to date, we've been very conservative. Like we haven't accepted any corporate debt. We haven't been willing to give you know, corporate security over the platform because you know, in a volatile industry, things happen. And the last thing we want to do um, is to expose ourselves to unnecessary risk. Um, 
So we've raised about 500 million US to date, a little bit more. Um, I think 90% of that is equity. Um, we've got a small amount of hardware financing, um, which is essentially asset finance of just the computers, where they've got security over just specific um, number of computers. I think that's a structure we will continually uh, continue to pursue. Um, in terms of other corporate structure and capital structure options, now that we've gone public, now that we've kind of locked in that base level of earnings, execution, uh, equity buffer, then there's enormous optionality in those capital markets, things from baby bonds, term loan B facilities, project financing structures. Um, fair to say that we're in active conversations with a number of parties around different types of options. We're not in a rush, um, but equally, as you're alluding to, capital is what um, gives players in this industry a competitive advantage and the ability to grow and get a greater share of that Bitcoin pie every 10 minutes. So it's something that we're uh, very focused on and optimizing for our shareholders. And I think we're, we're really happy with the position we're now in where we've got to a point where we do not expect to raise any more equity to fully fund that 15 exahash. So we've got a base kind of profile. We've got the land, the power, the chips. Uh, we're not going to, we don't expect to raise any more equity and give investors, right, there's line of sight on 15 exahash. Now we can build from there and leverage the platform um, and the optionality in it. Awesome. And yeah, just to fact check myself, actually, Riot has had debt in the past in order to finance its operations, but currently does have any debt on its books, uh, according to some information I'm looking at right now. But it, you have seen in the past that a lot of people have done this. It's very common to use equity markets in order to facilitate uh, growth to use debt or use equity of some sort uh, to build these operations out. But let's turn the page on that conversation and go to uh, the ESG conversation, which you were kind of teeing up a little bit earlier, but we moved away from. And it's notable that you said that S is what you guys are focusing on, focusing on that social aspect of ESG. Typically, the conversation is always about that E, right? Everyone's talking about the environment, but the S and the G are kind of lost in the dust <laughs> for, for whatever reason. But it's notable that you guys do these inspections, so to speak, of different locations before you choose to invest in them. You make sure that you're not going to drive up energy prices, that you would be a good partner in the region before uh, placing yourselves there. It's, I wouldn't say it's different than some of the other Bitcoin miners, but you guys seem to be more intent on uh, making the right choice for both the people in location and for yourselves, which is a little bit different. So just to throw the ball back into your court, I've seen you talk a little bit about the short-term game and the long-term vision for Iris and how you guys want to make the right short-term play now so that in the, in the long run, that 20 to 30-year window, your company is set up for success. And you're also set up for success because you're following through on that social, uh, social governance aspect of the ESG correctly. Can you kind of walk me through how you describe that to your investors or to your board members? How do you kind of think about uh, that ESG mandate at Iris? Absolutely. So, look, I shouldn't detract from the E, right? We've been 100% renewables since inception. Um, it's it's a bit of a non-negotiable in a way. It's just one of those things that you go, well, for us, it's always been so obvious. Use renewable energy. Um, you know, the traditional data center industry, every other industry is going there. Um, just start there. Don't have to pivot. Don't change late. So for us, it's it's a much greater threshold, not just renewable energy, like take that as a given, but how do we then use that energy in a way that actually benefits other people beyond our bottom line? Because that's not a sustainable business model. And that goes to probably the S, which is a good category for it and integrating into energy markets, um, into communities. Um, and we can come back to how we integrate into those energy markets in a minute. Then the, the G side is obviously critical, right? If you want to attract institutional capital, you need to build a business that is governed like an institutional platform. You need structured board, committees, policies, transparency, um, accountable roles and responsibilities within that organisation and transparency to those shareholders. Um, we appointed a chair, David Bartholomew, who successfully built a listed energy and infrastructure business um, over a 10-year period as CEO before selling it uh, to a, uh, a group out of Hong Kong called CKI for about $5 billion a few years ago. So extremely experienced in listed markets, governance, um, et cetera. Sorry about that background noise. There's a uh, 
bit of gardening going on next door. The uh, the joys of working from home. Apologies if it's coming through. Um, so that governance aspect is absolutely critical. I think I saw something saying we've got over sixty years of board experience um, on the board. And look, at the end of the day, it's accountability, transparency, um, and being honest. You know, everyone will make mistakes. We'll be up, we'll own up to them, and we'll just say here's the good, the bad. And as investors, it's up to you to make decisions um, around what you think of that. Yeah. So let's go back to the E then of uh, the renewable aspect. And maybe we can just kind of take a larger look at the whole ecosystem. How, how have you felt about the conversation about Bitcoin mining and ESG as, as a company that's dedicated to renewables, as a company that's dedicated to working in, this, in the right location and acting responsibly to the shareholders in that region? How have you felt the conversation has been placed so far? Has it been a lot of people think it's pretty disagreeable, right? The, the, the rhetoric so far has been very disagreeable towards Bitcoin mining. Have you felt that it's been fair, or adequate, or or valid in any sense? I, I think there's something we've got to address, which is that there's an unwinnable argument in some respects where if you're having discourse with someone who doesn't see value in Bitcoin, then any energy that's used to secure Bitcoin um, is going to be perceived as a waste of energy. And if you start at that base, then it's a discussion that can't actually go anywhere. Um, so I think the next phase is to then say, well, if you accept that free markets allow the direction of energy towards production, uh, productive uses, and at the end of the day, Bitcoin only uses energy because the market says it has value. The moment Bitcoin doesn't have value because the market doesn't see it is the moment that no one spends a dollar on any kilowatt hours of energy to secure it. So it's a really difficult rational argument to mount that Bitcoin mining is a waste of energy when it is so directly and intrinsically linked to the market price of Bitcoin, um, but that doesn't stop people doing it. So the, ne- the next stage, I guess, of analysis is to then say, well, why are people penalising an emerging technology? If there are negative externalities associated with producing electricity, well, hang on, like, let's go and, and deal with that. If coal-fired power stations are still billowing carbon into the atmosphere and people think that's a bad idea, then, hey, let's go and have a chat to that and address that. Don't go and talk to the people that are building a product that's valuable. You know, And, and you don't hear the same things around people playing their Xbox at home or using Netflix or using um, dishwashers and and washing machines because they save electricity. They use electricity to save time and, and um, deliver other benefits. But it, it's one of those things that's a really hard argument um, given, I guess, Bitcoin does use a lot of electricity, still a lot smaller than those applications, but it is sensitive because not everyone understands Bitcoin. Everyone can understand an Xbox and the enjoyment and utility that, that people get out of it, um, but Bitcoin's a little bit harder. So I, I in, in terms of personal views on whether Bitcoin should continue to only focus on renewables or fossil fuels, in some ways we're doing what we're doing because we believe in it, but my personal opinion is not what matters. What matters is what the market decides, uh, what investors want and what society wants um, as part of those kind of broader impacts. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Uh, Australia, does has the conversation for ESG been a little bit different than the United States or do you think it's been pretty similar across the board? Just since you guys are an Australian-based company, I'm wondering if the conversation has been different and then also what the interacting with lawmakers there has been. There's a lot of lobbying efforts here in the States now on, on the local, state, and federal level, but I haven't heard much about it uh, for Australia or other um, other countries. Yeah, there has been a little bit, and I actually read a news article this morning, so grain of salt, that said something like 20 out of the top 50 or 20 out of the top 100 projects um, in Bitcoin and crypto actually were originated out of Sydney, Australia. So it does seem like it's becoming a bit of a hub, which is, yeah, go Australia. Um, in, in terms of the energy market here, we've seen similar dynamic to Texas with the build out of a lot of intermittent renewables, uh, increased volatility in the networks, uh, time of day production. Um, and we actually saw a proposal last year put up um, for a tax incentive for Bitcoin miners that use renewable energy. I think it was a 10% tax rebate for Bitcoin miners that use renewable energy, perhaps signifying that people are starting to understand the benefits that these facilities can provide into those networks. So there's certainly um, you know a variety of, of views. It seems as progressive as, as anywhere um, else uh, in the world. 
Um, we're obviously looking closely at the local market here, haven't yet announced any specific projects, um, but anywhere that's got abundant renewables, got problems to solve, we'll, we'll focus on. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering going forward how the conversation turns to the international community because there has been definitely an uptick of, in rhetoric in the United States on ESG, especially with like Elizabeth Warren sending that letter to Riot and Marathon and others the other week about their energy consumption. Um, so I think it's definitely something to watch going forward for at least our audience. Daniel, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the Compass podcast with us and letting us know what's happening with Iris Energy. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Will. Appreciate your uh, time and the opportunity to chat. For sure. And for our audience, I want to uh, ask you guys to like and subscribe to this video. Be sure to check us out on YouTube as well. Uh, sharing this information with other miners only helps out their builds as well and helps protect the Bitcoin network. So be sure to do that. But from all of us at Compass, thanks for tuning in.